From Number 5 Chambers, I'm Richard Kimbley. This is the Planning Podcast. This week, Planning Enforcement. Enforcement Investigation. Difficulties in issuing notices and commencing criminal proceedings. Solutions for local authorities. And the timescales for appeals, particularly if evidence on oath is required. With Scott Stemp and Howard Leithhead. Planning and Environmental Barristers at Number 5 Chambers, the planning podcast asks whether the sharp end of planning has been blunted by the crisis. Hi Scott, how's it going? It's going very well Richard, thank you. It's a lovely sunny day outside and very glad to be sat down here having a chat about some matters concerning planning enforcement with you. Good to be with you Scott and Howard, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Splendid to have you with us. How are you, Howard? I'm very well. How are you, Richard? Yeah, really good. Really good. Now then, Scott, help me with this. Uh, I'm stuck. I need help with a planning enforcement matter. I need an online resource. Where do I go? Luckily for you, Richard, the RTPI and NAEP have collaborated with a number of practitioners in the field a number of us from number five and other practitioners uh, from other firms uh, and other outfits have uh, collaborated together to produce the NAEP Enforcement Handbook, which launched on Monday the 18th of May. NAEP, National Association... For Planning Enforcement. Thank you. Good. OK, so and uh, we can go direct to that online using the link from our website and that's free, yeah? It's it's a free online resource uh, available for uh, anyone who finds themselves in a, in a bind on planning enforcement intended to give uh, a practical steer on pretty much every step in relation to planning enforcement from the early stages of gathering information all the way through to the end of the process and securing compliance with orders and notices that have already been secured. OK, so it's an end to end a handbook pointing you in the right direction for various stages and on the key issues that crop up for officers. Yes, with a with very much a bent on practical advice and guidance uh, and best suggestions for for what to look out for and where to go to next. Well, well done to to all of the collaborators for giving their time uh, and their knowledge. It's terrific and well done, RTPI. Yes. Now. Um, I imagine that it was uh, prepared pre-COVID, pre-crisis. Is that right? Yes, it it was prepared pre-COVID. The advantage to having it as an online resource is that as things change, chapters can be updated and amended to accommodate the situation as it develops. Although, of course, we've got a fairly rapidly developing situation in terms of the planning world reacting to the changes in the outside world and and the COVID situation. What's happening in local authorities so far as uh, staffing is concerned? Uh, Are people being furloughed? Well, for for public sector bodies, the the government's advice has been not to furlough staff, although I do understand that local authorities have been redeploying their staff, uh, but they shouldn't be being furloughed by and large. The problem really, I think, comes for clients who may be reliant on professional advisors helping them respond to enforcement inquiries, but of course consultancies, solicitors, other professionals may well be furloughed and that's going to sometimes severely affect their ability to respond to any inquiries that authorities have. Got it. So you you would expect work to continue on investigations. Now, Howard, so far as the investigation of breaches is concerned, is there any particular difficulty that you've identified as a result of the crisis? And is there any way that technology or other solutions might present themselves to address those crisis difficulties? That's absolutely right, Richard. There, there are a number of difficulties, uh, but fortunately solutions and, and people have been really good at finding new solutions to these problems uh, almost on a, on a day by day or weekly basis. Uh, and there are a number of delays uh, for local authorities caused by the redeployment of staff. Uh, this includes both uh, enforcement officers and also uh, members of the legal team. Uh, and this 
has particular problems for detecting and investigating breaches. There's also difficulties in gathering evidence. Of course, site visits are, are often necessary uh, and officers have to make a careful judgment as to whether social distancing is possible, whether it's appropriate to enter sites and whether it's appropriate or possible to speak to witnesses. Uh, and of course, exercising powers of entry also brings the question of obstruction, whether somebody is being obstructive in trying to prevent a planning officer from entering the property. In, in, in dealing with this, it's important to remember that social distancing is only guidance. It isn't part of the coronavirus regulations. So the key uh, consideration is to consider whether or not the planning officer is being reasonable in observing social distancing. So careful judgments will need to be made to ensure the safety of the witness, the safety of the planning officer, and to make sure that any arguments about obstruction can be dealt with as fairly as possible if, if it comes to that. As to solutions, there are a number of technological uh, solutions. Uh, drones are being increasingly uh, used, not just by the Derbyshire police, as we saw, but, but in many, many planning enforcement uh, contexts, it's now possible to, to use drones rather than send a, uh, an officer onto the site. Another factor may be that only pre-arranged site visits can take place. And there are also solutions to collecting witness statements, interviews under caution. These don't have to be done in person. It is possible to do them via video link. So I think the overall takeaway point is there are delays, there are a number of challenges, but it isn't impossible to carry on detecting and investigating breaches. Well, that's fantastic. And thank you very much for the, for the drone point. I imagine that many an enforcement officer would uh, relish the thought of getting out and about with a drone. That sounds like terrific fun. Um, now, back to the law. Uh, enforcement is a topic which uh, has important deadlines hardwired into the 1990 Act. Scott, were, are there any problems that arise there? And um, particularly in the context of delays uh, in investigation? Well, Richard, I, th I think there are some important points to bear in mind, particularly for local authorities, although, of course, clients will be alive to this as well, that the time limits set out, for example, at Section 171B of the Act are operating as normal. They, they don't take regard or have regard to the difficulties experienced by an authority because of manpower or because of an inability to get onto the site because, for example, social distancing is in operation or the coronavirus regulations are preventing them. So the authority's ordinary deadlines for detecting or investigating or actioning breaches still remain. And that's going to have a knock-on uh, effect in terms of any proceedings that come out of them as well, because again, the deadlines that authorities would normally face for taking action beyond that also apply. Issuing of notices, issuing of proceedings are probably all going to be experiencing some degree of delay. Not only is there the issue of potential redeploying of staff uh, that we've already mentioned, uh, but also the effects just of remote working, because if people are working at home, they're not able to get out uh, onto sites, they're not able to get out into offices, and they're just not able to process and issue the paperwork. Now, that's going to be something which affects not only local authorities and their ability to actually issue and progress cases and notices, but it's also going to affect clients and their advisors because they're not going to be around uh, either at all or in numbers in their offices to be able to process paperwork that is received by local authority, uh, from local authorities or paperwork that's received from, for example, any courts. There's two points there, aren't there? There's, there's, there's courts, which you're just coming to, but the, the previous point was connected with uh, the administrative stage of enforcement, the issuing of the notice and any appeal. But there is then, in many cases, the subsequent stage, the criminal proceeding stage, in respect to the courts, and that's what you were just coming to, I think. Yes, and, and the, the same problems and the same kinds of delays will exist once you get to the stage of any court proceedings, as local authorities and clients will experience uh, 
in the substantive process of getting to the issuing of notices because as well as local authorities having staff redeployed and having uh, to deal with remote working and how papers and ad administrative processes are still worked through the same thing is happening with courts a lot of their staff are being redeployed a lot of their staff are working remotely a lot of courts actually aren't even open to accept new proceedings being issued uh, and the staff that are actually in court buildings are not there in numbers to be able to process any of the applications that come through to them Add, allied to the fact that a lot of courts now aren't accepting paper-based submissions anymore as a, as a coronavirus step. They're, they're moving entirely to electronic submissions, all skeletons and applications being sent in via email rather than in hard copy. Now, Scott, I have seen a very large number. That number was 300,000. Have you seen that number? <laughs> Yes, there's some discussion amongst the senior judiciary at the moment about how to get particularly criminal cases back on track because, of course, criminal courts have not, by and large, been sitting through the coronavirus situation in any event. There's a, a pre-existing backlog of cases, the, the backlog of cases that Crown Courts and Magistrates Courts simply haven't gotten to which was there before lockdown happened. And there are a variety of reasons why that backlog exists, but it's a, it's a sizable backlog. There's, there's estimated, and the figures that, that, that are being talked about are some 37,000 cases in Crown Courts, which are the pre-lockdown backlog. And in Magistrates Courts, there's a f nearly 300,000 cases at various stages and of various types that are simply the pre-lockdown backlog of cases, cases that haven't been processed and sent to the Crown Court, cases that haven't been processed in the Magistrates Court, cases that haven't been finalised in the Magistrates Court. So there's, a, there's an enormous pre-lockdown backlog that already existed before any effects of the coronavirus measures on the ability of the court to take and process new cases is factored in. That's extraordinary. So the, the 300,000 number and the equivalent number in the Crown Court being 37,000 is the baseline. Yes, it's it's a, an easily overlooked thing, I think, particularly with magistrates' courts, that the, the nature of the work that magistrates' courts address on a daily basis is hugely varied. It's very broad and covers an enormous spectrum of legal work. And there's a finite amount of time that magistrates' courts have available to them to work through all of those different types of cases in any event. And they, and they deal with an enormous quantity in terms of the proportion of work that's going through the court system. Magistrates' courts deal with an enormous proportion of that just by volume because of the nature and type of cases they, they deal with. So once that all effectively came to a halt because magistrates have only been processing what they identify as urgent cases for the past six to eight weeks now uh, there's an enormous amount of work which has largely just stopped and, and stopped dead okay well taking those two stages again uh, issue of notices and appeals the administrative stage first what what do you see as to the future of enforcement activity uh, in this period of the crisis, uh, hopefully emerging from it uh, to some degree uh, now, what do you see for the future in that regard? In terms of the issuing of notices and how it, things manage to move forward from here, I think there's a few considerations that, that will need to be borne in mind. There's obviously already with enforcement appeals a sizable caseload and quite a delay in terms of the appeal stage from validation to decision and again there are various reasons that feed into that but it, it's there and we can't escape from it and feeding into that is going to be whatever caseload of new matters, new breaches that are detected, new notices that are issued and then appealed. So there's going to be, I think, a need for, in the short term, 
perhaps varied ways of working to get through what will be a larger case volume of new notices being issued and new appeals being made. From a local authority's point of view, it might be that there's going to be a need for uh, some greater level of flexibility in the timings of steps, the requirements that they have of sites and of people who are on sites in order to ease that working back into the system. I suspect there's quite a few people who, once they're on the receiving end of enforcement action and realize that actually they can't really get away with what it is they've been doing, but would actually really just need more time or want more time to be able to take steps or, or be willing to discuss and negotiate with the local authority about how to resolve a matter. That may well be something which authorities will need to, to have in mind, whether they've identified particular situations where there, this is something that can be resolved by allowing someone a bit more time than might otherwise be, or allowing them a bit more leeway in what's been going on in a site that otherwise the authority might ordinarily prefer to be the situation. Because of course the alternative is going to be potentially ending up being mired in a very long backlog of cases that if we're just processing everything through in a way that we were before the coronavirus, potentially ends up with joining the back of what is becoming an increasingly long queue to, to get through to the stage of actually having an effective notice in your hand. Now, Scott, another number, 84. In the stage uh, between the issuing of the notice and any criminal proceedings, there's of course the uh, question of appeal. And I think that the number 84 uh, already figures in that regard. It does. PINs have suspended publication of their uh, timescales and, and how they're meeting their targets for uh, deadlines for processing appeals from validation through to decision. And we can all understand the reasons why they've done that in the current circumstances. But as I was mentioning before, the, the difficulty particularly that enforcement cases have faced is that they can often have um, complex and very particular requirements for determination at appeal. There are a select group of inspectors who deal with enforcement appeals uh, on behalf of PINs. And as at January, February of this year, the situation was that PINs were looking at an 84 week on average period from validation of an, an enforcement appeal through to the inquiry having a decision issued on it, which is a, a substantial amount of time in itself. But when you move that back into the context of the life of an enforcement case as a whole, that's 84 weeks only for the appeal stage. There's a whole period of time before you get to the stage of the appeal. And there will almost certainly be periods of time after the notice comes into force at the end of the appeal process, where there are then all other kinds of considerations which feature in, which leaves authorities and individuals or site operators in a situation of having an enforcement situation, which is just going on realistically for years. Now, Scott, I've been watching carefully what's been happening in other jurisdictions, family, uh, High Court, Queen's Bench trials, uh, jury trials, and there's been, there's been movement of, of different types and magnitudes in, in those jurisdictions, but there's been the slowest movement in respect of those disputes which need to be resolved by the hearing of evidence from witnesses live. And in looking at what's been happening at PINs, it seems to me that the potential for evidence to be heard on oath remotely might pose a much more significant difficulty than hearing evidence from experts in the way one normally would in a Section 78 appeal. Uh, what, what do you think is likely to happen in the future so far as that flavour of enforcement appeal is concerned? Yes, I think the, the taking of evidence on oath 
in a remote working scenario is something which has, uh, it seems to me, troubled all types and levels of courts and tribunals. It's something which pre-coronavirus, uh, Crown Courts, Family Courts, did on a semi-regular basis where they would be able to hear complainants or witnesses in certain types of cases, very often sexual offences, over the medium of a live link, a remote link. That was in very controlled circumstances though. You'd have the witness sat in a room, they would be capable of being observed by court staff, they could be controlled in terms of the circumstances and situation around them so it could be seen that they hadn't been given any additional prompting they hadn't been given any untoward assistance there was nothing improper going on that lack of control if you apply that to effectively people just giving evidence over skype or through zoom or something from their living rooms or at the kitchen table or wherever they might be the lack of control, the lack of scrutiny, uh, and the lack of uh, ability to ensure that there's no impropriety affecting a witness giving their evidence on oath is something which is, is causing very real problems at all levels and types of court. And if you look outside of a planning jurisdiction, it's an area that criminal courts have not sought to tread into. Although criminal courts are working, they're doing a much reduced caseload and largely only working through administrative type hearings on a, on a remote connection basis. Family courts have gone a bit further. Some family courts have actually undertaken uh, hear, entire hearings remotely and occasionally have taken evidence uh, remotely, largely restricted still though to the giving of evidence by professional witnesses over a video link rather than having lay witnesses come in and give their evidence uh, remotely over something like a, a Skype or a, a webcam platform. In terms of where the planning inspectorate might want to take their remote hearing of inquiries and virtual inquiries, it's undoubtedly the case that the same kind of concerns uh, underpin the issues that would, might affect an enforcement appeal uh, going forward. I think probably the scenario is likely, I think, to develop where you can have various enforcement appeals which maybe don't concern the hearing of evidence on oath or maybe concern evidence only from professionals or deal on legal submissions. So if you have an inquiry where you're dealing with, for example, a ground B and a ground C argument, uh, that the the facts haven't happened or, or that the, the whatever's happened doesn't constitute a breach of planning controls or if you're having an, an argument about whether planning should be granted or not that concerns only really technical aspects and, and technical evidence. You may find a scenario where PINs actually think that these are enforcement appeals that can be progressed more expeditiously via remote working than something where you've got either a certificate appeal or a ground D appeal where there are lay witnesses who are going to be giving evidence. Because again, the lack of ability to see into the room that the witness is giving their evidence from is, is a major concern for, for all levels of courts and tribunals because there needs to be transparency about the evidence that people are giving to, to all levels of courts and tribunals. Well, Scott, that's a wonderful explanation as to why there are those concerns and the impact which they may well have. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Howard, at the outset, you referred us to the regulations, which are the public health, open brackets, coronavirus restrictions, close brackets, open brackets, England, close brackets, regulations. You referred there to reasonable excuse, but we get reasonable steps, don't we? We get this concept of reasonable actions in the 1990 Act in the context of prosecution. What, what's going to be the impact, do you think, of that, either for local authorities minded to prosecute or for those who might be in receipt of such a prosecution? Indeed, yes. I think the key word is flexibility. Local authorities are going to need to take a flexible approach. So if uh, there's an enforcement notice in place, there will be a period for compliance very often a person won't be able to comply with the notice. Uh, 
local planning authorities shouldn't rush into prosecuting because, of course, there's a defence under Section 1793 that a person did everything he could be reasonably expected to do to secure compliance with a notice. So for those in receipt of an enforcement notice, it would be sensible for them to get in touch with the local planning authority to explain their difficulties in complying and to make the local authority aware that they're doing everything they can do in order to comply. Local authorities in deciding whether to prosecute should think carefully whether a person has in fact had the opportunity, the reasonable opportunity to comply with the enforcement notice. One sensible way round that or from the local authority's perspective would be to write to the person in receipt of the enforcement notice and say, we realise that you are likely to have had problems complying. We're prepared to effectively extend the date for another six months or however long, and we won't prosecute you in this time, but we will prosecute you if you don't comply by X date, unless you give us good reason why, again, uh, it, that wouldn't be reasonable. Well, Howard, thank you very much indeed for that. That, I think, brings to a conclusion the really brilliant excursion that you've both provided through the range of issues which might arise from investigation through to uh, ultimately prosecution and assessing whether or not compliance is being properly undertaken. So thank you very much. But I have one remaining question, which, which was this. Uh, so, Scott, just remind me, is there a book that your name appears in? There is. On the uh, Monday the 18th of May, NAEP and the RTPI launched an enforcement handbook which I and uh, others from number five have contributed chapters towards on the process of planning enforcement all the way from beginning to end. Beginning to end. Both, thank you very much indeed. Till the next time. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. That was the planning podcast from number five chambers. Next week, Tim Jones and Hashi Mohammed will be taking a week away from COVID consequences when the planning podcast will turn to neighbourhood planning. In the meantime, stay safe and remember, there's a new handbook out.